Good morning, adventure friends, and welcome to another exciting virtual tour with Pretty Gritty Tours. I'm your host and guide today, Captain Chris Stoddinker. If you've never seen me before, well then welcome. I am an adventurer and an explorer and a tour guide that lives and works here in Tacoma, Washington, and I've had the privilege of exploring all over the world, but one of my favorite places to be and explore by far is right here in Washington State. And today, I'm gonna take you guys on a quick tour of some of the coolest caves in Washington State, because we've got a lot of them here. Not a lot of people know it, but there is a huge amount of caves right underground, just outside of the Tacoma area. And so we're gonna look at a few of them today, and I hope that you enjoy it. As always, if you guys have any questions, you can put them in the comments on either our YouTube or our Facebook channel, and I will do my best to answer them if I know the answer. Uh, and if you're watching right now, I can actually do those live. So let's see here. Oh, my good friend Steve Dunkelberger is here uh, offering up his pith helmet, but you're, you're in luck, Steve. I actually came equipped for all safety needs already. So if we're gonna get into some caves, we need to do it safely. Which actually brings me to my first point tonight, my friends. Uh, caves are dangerous. So no matter what you learn today, make sure that you remember uh, you need to be equipped if you're going to do any sort of cave exploration or spelunking. I personally never go into a cave if I don't have three flashlights, backup batteries, and a propane lantern. Some might say that's a little too prepared, but I'm still alive, so you judge for yourselves. Other than that, uh, let's take a look at a, a cool map of Washington here. So this isn't necessarily the best map of Washington for you guys to cut your teeth on, but it does have all of the 40 plus caves in Washington marked in their relative location. There are some caves in Washington state that we're not gonna tell you where they are because they are so dangerous that unless you're a professional and you're invited by another professional, you shouldn't go into them. Because remember, caves are dangerous. I'm gonna show you some of the safest and greatest ones to explore today. And the best one that I always like to recommend to people are the ape caves. You've probably heard of the ape caves already. They're just in the Southern part of Washington state down by the like Mount Rainier location. And these are a lava tube. Now there's a lot of different types of caves that you can explore and they're all formed in different ways. And a huge amount of the caves in Washington are actually lava tubes, which is pretty cool how those are formed. And I'll tell you here in a second. But before I do anything, I have to give a, a huge thank you to my adventure buddy in life, Ben Herndon. Ben Herndon is my, my like travel compadre who the majority of photographs that you're gonna see from our tour tonight this rad dude right here took those photos. So if you wanna check out the rest of his stuff, benherndon.com, he does uh, like a cool collection of outdoor photography, like adventure supping, rock climbing, paragliding. He's kind of the coolest and I'm happy to know him. So we actually went together to do this exploration of the ape caves here. Uh, and here's me getting prepped with my adventure equipment. This is the propane lantern that I take with me into all caving expeditions because light becomes the most important thing anywhere that you're going in a cave uh, and you discover that pretty quickly. And it's important, I think, right now to mention that to be a cave, you technically have to be a, a depression in the earth where you go so deep that you can't see natural light anymore. That's the like official definition of a cave. And there are a lot of things we're going to see today that aren't technically caves. There are like karst formations and tunnels and whatnot. But to be a true cave, you have to be a occurrence in the earth, a hollow area where you can go so deep that you can't see normal light anymore. Just for your, for your education. <laughs> so this is inside the ape caves, which are the longest lava tubes in Washington state. And this occurred during an eruption of Mount St. Helens, where all of this hot lava came pouring out of the volcano. And on the exterior of that lava, it got cool and turned into hot rock. But on the inside, the lava stayed super, super hot and actually created an underground river. 
and kept flowing throughout the area. And it looked something like this when it was being formed. So that's hot lava or lava in the middle there. And on the outside is the lava that has cooled creating that sort of rock tunnel. And as that continues to flow throughout the area, you end up with these caves. And so thousands of years later, you end up with these. So these are the ape caves and they run all through the ground, just over two miles long with all these tunnels that you can now go through and explore. And it makes a lot of cool rock formations because there are areas where the lava would drip down and make puddles or there were where it would create spatters where it looked like rainfall. And all of that molten liquid rock as it cools makes these cool formations throughout the ape caves as you go through. To give you a, a more scientific look at that, here's an, a lava tube, and it's got that void on top, that empty space, the hard basalt rock on the exterior there, and then the molten lava pond in the middle. Pretty cool stuff, honestly. And let's see, I'll take you guys, this is me just looking super cool in a, in a lava tube, no big deal, propane lantern and all. Uh, but we're going to actually take you guys quickly. I've got some video of us actually exploring the ape cave so that you can get a look inside it there. And it's not only one of the longest caves in Washington state, but one of the tallest. Normally, if you're doing a lot of exploration or spelunking of caves in Washington, you kind of have to crawl through a few spots. With the ape caves, you can not only stand up throughout the entirety of your journey, but there are actually places where it looks so high up that it's almost like a cathedral ceiling down there. So let's take a look. So we have arrived. Oh, so Hopefully we have arrived we at the first cave of our expedition, the ape cave. And it's uh, surprisingly nice up here today. There's a complete lack of snow in mid-February. We have way too much gear for this particular expedition, but um, better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Ben's nodding his head. Now, that sound you hear is actually water dripping from the top of the cave. And the water from melting snow or rain collects on the surface, runs through the ground, and then actually drips down like a rain shower inside the cave here. Not enough to make like flooding or river flows very often, but enough that it's constantly sounding like it's raining there during the wet season. We've already got a sweet question here. Why are they called the ape caves? They sound super mysterious, right? Like there was some sort of mm, discovery of an ape that was found down there. But the, the actual story is a little less mysterious than that. The Mount Rainier apes, which were a mountaineering and exploration group, officially discovered this lava tube formation and gave it their own name. So the ape caves are named after the mountaineering group the uh, Mount Rainier apes. It's nothing to do with actual apes being discovered down there. But don't worry. We actually have a cave later on in our tour that was named after an animal that was trapped inside. Hoo -hoo -hoo -hoo. Uh, and here's another great question. Once this tour is done being live, it will be alive forever on both our YouTube channel and our Facebook page. So if you want to come back and visit any of these tours, you totally can at any time you want. We just figured that 11 a.m. on a Thursday would be a good time for people if they were trying to do some distance learning. But don't worry, these will always be up, available, and free. So anytime you want to come back and visit any of these caves safely, you can do so from the comfort of your own home. Uh, so this is the exit from the ape caves. If you go all the way to the end of this lava tube formation, at the very end, you have the opportunity to go up this sketchy looking ladder and then you actually go through a small formation and then out into daylight, which if you've been doing this for the you know two plus miles of that entire formation down there. You've now been underground for a long period of time. Uh, there's a lot of like rock scrambling that has to be done. A couple locations you actually have to climb up over a ledge to continue on down. 
The first part of the lava tube is very easily accessible. People go down all the time. It's easy walking. You could take little kids without any problem at all. As you continue down, it gets a little more uh, technical. At no point will you need ropes or ascenders or anything, but you will be uh, encouraged to do a little more climbing as you get to the end of it. So it's not for everyone. By the time you get out there, you can exit through that uh, tunnel entrance right there and then Hey, presto, you're back out in the world. So let's talk now about one of my favorite caves in Washington State, the Guler Ice Caves. And this one actually has a much more straightforward name. As you may have already guessed from the picture, they're called the Ice Caves because they have year-round ice inside. This is down just on the Columbia River, sort of near the Oregon-Washington border in a place called Trout Lake. And this is a national park or a state park that you can visit all the time. You just need your recreation pass to go out to it and then you can go down and explore these. And even in the peak heat of summer, inside the ice caves, you will find towers and cylinders and globes of fresh ice. And the way that the cave is formed and the way that the air flows into it creates a constantly freezing atmosphere. And it used to be used for food storage by the indigenous people down there. And then later when it was discovered by people who were coming out and settling the area, they would actually go in, harvest ice, barge it across the Columbia River and then use it to chill drinks in Hood River just across the way. Uh, I've also got some cool footage of inside the ice caves that we can show you right now as well. Let's go. So you can see it still has water dripping down just like the ape caves did, but it's not nearly as deep and there's ice everywhere, which doesn't occur in the ape caves as much, if at all. There's Ben committing to the shot with a high-tech high plastic bag wrapped around his expensive camera. So what's so cool about this one is that it's even easier to explore than the ape caves, as long as you don't... Uh, go too hazardous and go slipping around in there. No ice skating inside the cave, I'm sad to say. But if you're, if you're interested in exploring it, like I said, year round, you'll find ice down there and it makes these cool formations. And in some cases, it actually creates uh, tubes because as the water drips down onto it, if it's warm enough, it will create a hollow indentation into the cave. The ice caves are a good point to talk about sort of the zones on caves. Every cave, if it's deep enough, which if it's a true cave, it should be, we'll have a series of zones. So at the beginning where there's always daylight when the sun is out is called the entrance. As you get deeper into it, there's a twilight zone where it becomes a little murkier. Even in the high heat of full daylight, you still will get just a little bit of darkness in there, sort of like twilight, like beginning of day or end of day. You get your transition zone after that, and then by the time that you get to an area where there is no light ever, that's the deep of the cave. And different kinds of animals live in the different zones. You have visitors, animals that live in the sort of cave entrance are called visitors, and those are animals that just go to get out of the weather every now and then, or look for a safe place to sleep. You get um, animals that live in the sort of twilight zone down there, and then by the time you get to the deep, the full dark of the cave, you have animals that are called troglodytes. Uh, and those are animals that live without sunlight ever. And they usually are super, super pale. And sometimes they don't even have eyes because they are adapted to living in the dark of a cave. And if you were to take them out of the cave, they wouldn't be able to survive. They're specially set up to live in a completely dark environment, which is pretty cool. When you're looking at the ice here in the Guler Ice Caves, you can see those formations that are formed by the water dripping down from the ceiling and then freezing into ice globes or ice towers down there. Now I went in February when it was already cold, but if you go back in July or even August, despite that heat, you'll still find ice inside the cave. Right next door to this though, is one of the coolest caves ever 
both literally and figuratively, this is called the Trout Lake Cheese Caves. And they've had some different names over a period of time there, but they're special because you can make cheese inside them. In the caves in France, they create a kind of cheese called Roquefort cheese, which is created by leaving it inside a cave until it molds in this special way, giving it a flavor that a lot of people like. There's very few caves in the United States where you can create the same sort of thing here, but the Trout Lake Cheese Caves, as the name might imply, are one of the few locations where you can create an American uh, Roquefort style cheese. And they used to do that in the 1930s and 40s. This is an example of a French cave there, but this is a look inside the Trout Lake Cheese Caves. Now, for whatever reason, they don't make cheese inside these caves anymore. In fact, it's private property now, so you have to ask permission from the timber company that owns the land on top if you can go explore these caves. And where the cheese company used to be, there's an old abandoned building. And in the floor of that building, there's a staircase that goes down into the cheese caves. We actually have a look at that here, so come on inside. Well, it took a, a small amount of investigative work, but I believe we found the cheese caves or we have found some horrible creature's den. Ben's about to find out. Now the floor of the cheese caves is super rough. And we actually have a good question here about what kind of footwear you might wanna wear in the ice caves or beyond. I always recommend just like a sturdy hiking boot. Uh, you don't need to wear crampons or anything. Even though the ice caves are full of ice, it's only in certain areas and there are actually paths that you can meander through without worrying about slipping too much. But a good sturdy boot is going to be something that you really want to invest in if you're going to do any sort of spelunking. Because as you saw from the floor in the cheese caves there, all that volcanic rock dries really sharp or cools really sharp, as the case may be. And so you can uh, cut up any kind of shoe, really. So you want something with a nice sturdy rubber sole down there. Now the cheese caves are completely empty today, but there are still some remnants inside there uh, of what the cheese aging equipment used to look like. So if you come down the passageway through this cool entrance right here, you can actually go to the very back of the cave and all of the wooden shelves where they used to age the cheese are actually still located down there if you wanna take a look at them. Uh, Here's another example of all those shelves that have just fallen apart and rotted over time. And what's so cool about this shot is that you can see how high the ceiling of this cave is. It's another lava tube like the Ave Caves, but it is almost consistently 40 feet high. It has a very lofted sort of cathedral ceiling and is really cool down there. Now, on our expedition to see the caves, Ben and I camped in central Washington, uh, right here, and then actually went to another one of the greatest cave formations in the state, though not truly a cave, it's a karst formation, or an area where water has seeped into basalt, volcanic rock, and then frozen, expanded, frozen, expanded, frozen, expanded, and on and on until it's pried rocks apart and created sort of indentations in the ground. None of the Lake Lenore caverns or karst formations are deep enough that you'll be away from sunlight. Uh, I think maybe 50, 60 feet deep at their deepest, but they are massive formations. And while not true caves, they still earn the title of cave. What's special and unique about these ones, other than the incredible view that you have out there, is the fact that these ones have been used for thousands of years by indigenous nations in the central Washington area as um, seasonal dwellings. They would come out and live inside these caves and then hunt and fish in the area. 
gather plants and roots and then winter in them and then go on in sort of a nomadic lifestyle outwards from there. And some remnants of those first cultures being out there are still visible inside the caves today. Uh, there are pictographs, there are, uh, you'll find sometimes tools left out there, and they're easy to access, fortunately, and protected by the state. So you can actually park just in central Washington in the Cooley area, and then actually go and explore the Lenore Caverns however you want. And you can see how tiny I look exploring some of these, these massive basalt towers stretch up into the sky and there's all sorts of paths that you can go explore out there and fortunately we have some cool footage for you right here so this whole area was formed in a flash when the missoula ice dams over in montana broke and all that glacial water ripped through central washington along the columbia river area and just scooped off all that rock It left these huge open areas and a lot of these karst formations. And actually you can see in and a then second, see, and then see. back here is what they would do. So you have the natural, have the overhang, natural of the overhang of the cliff. And then they and made these like made little, these like little stone shelters. Yeah, yeah. That you could just you chillax, could just chillax and... I assume they put down some sort of bedding, because that, that looks horrible. That looks horrible. <laughs> so the Lenore and area karst formations, this is actually on the other side of the coulee from that karst formation we were just in. And you can see the view is spectacular. So if you're looking to do any sort of camping or easy spelunking cave exploration, I always recommend to people that's a good place to start because it's a, an incredible area to go explore and it's, it's an easy way to get into caving. And as you can see, they don't disappoint. But if you're looking for a cave where you are truly out of the sunlight zone into deep cave territory, one of the more unique caves in Washington state is actually Gardner Cave. Now Gardner Cave is different from all the caves we've talked about so far because it's not formed as a karst formation, it's not a lava tube, it's a more traditional cave in that it's created when water seeps in through the ground and then erodes different types of rock. So as a rock becomes more acidic, uh, it can eat away softer rock and then leave these large open areas here, like the Gardner Cave, which is north of Spokane, really, really close to the Canadian border. And this is a state park as well. And it's one of the more maintained ones. They do a really good job of lighting the entire experience. So if you're gonna start your cave exploration lifestyle, this is a really good one to get into, literally. Uh, you can go through it. You don't have to necessarily bring a bunch of flashlights or anything like that because, again, they've lit this entire experience for you. But when you're looking at it, you can see with this diagram here the different ways the caves are formed. And so when the water seeps through the ground and creates caves like this, you get stalactites and stalagmites. Uh, stalactites come from the ceiling and look like icicles of rock. Stalagmites are where those minerals drip down and like in the ice caves, they build a cone up from the floor. And in fact, the Gardner Cave has one of the largest stalagmites in the world. And I think I've got a picture of it. No, I don't. Silly me, that's ridiculous. But when we're talking about traditional cave formations, this is actually the Mammoth Cave. This is over on the East Coast, and this is the longest cave system in the world at over 400 miles long. So I'll put some links to that as well because that's one worth talking about and exploring, but it's not in Washington State, so I can't linger too much on it. Uh, now, if we're talking about cool caves, I will be wrong if I didn't mention the Blue Lake Rhino Cave. Now, this is called a cave. Uh, it is technically only about eight feet long. But what happened is outside of Blue Lake in the middle of central Washington, 
when there was a lava formation, it was flowing along, it flowed over the top of a prehistoric rhinoceros. And when it flowed over the top of the rhinoceros, it cooled on the exterior more quickly. And then the body of the rhinoceros was trapped inside there until eventually it decayed and disappeared. And what was left behind is this cast, this formation where you can actually see the upside down rhinoceros. And so you can climb into this cave, which is essentially just a form of the body of the rhinoceros through its, I think, back left hip. Uh, and that's what you're that's what you're looking at right here. This is an illustration of what those prehistoric rhinoceroses, rhinoceri, would have looked like out there. And it's out in the Blue Lake area to this day. It's a super cool cave. Uh, and yeah, the Rhino Cave at the Burke Museum in Seattle is is a great example too. And I think actually out in the Dry Falls area, they have a a reproduction of what the rhinoceros would have looked like and then like a cast of that as well. And the Dry Falls area, if you haven't heard about it, is really, really cool. It is an area where that glacial flood flowed through central Washington and created a massive, like larger than Niagara Falls waterfall. But today it's of course completely dry, but it's this breathtaking area out there worth looking into if you find yourself in central Washington. Now we're going to take a quick detour really quick because there is a cave, while not technically in Washington, that I want to at least talk to you briefly about. Here's an early picture of it, and I can't actually tell you where this cave is other than to tell you that it's somewhere in Oregon. But uh, a lot of vandalism and, and trespassing have gone on in this cave, so I'm trying to keep the location of it a little bit more secret. But inside is an over one mile long lake. The cave continues throughout the ground for a long period of time, well, almost over two miles, I believe. Uh, but a huge portion of that is this beautiful lake inside of it. Uh, and Ben and I actually got permission to go inside of it. And then we took these inflatable sups into the cave, these stand-up paddle boards, and actually did an exploration inside there. And so I've got some footage of that in there. One of the cool things that you can see is actually a, a wooden boat that people were using to transport themselves around inside the cave a long time ago, but it got scuttled and sank inside the cave. And you can see it in this just dazzlingly clear blue water in there. So these are the inflatable stand-up paddle boards that we took inside the cave. We inflated them here at the entrance and then hiked them in so that we could actually launch right here. And it's difficult to see in the dark but we're actually getting ready to go an additional mile down the cave on this subterranean lake. And there's the boat underwater inside the cave, which I think is just pretty amazing. And here you can see us cruising along on the seps. So again, I, I don't wanna tell you exactly where this cave is in, in Oregon. I think respecting these caves and making sure that they're a treasure that future people can enjoy is so incredibly important just to, you know, spelunking in general. One of the caves that people don't talk about its location is actually Newton Cave. And Newton Cave is another non-lava formed cave. Uh, it's a karst of, you know, karst formations as well as that more traditional acidic water eroding softer stone. And Newton Cave is in Washington State. It is the deepest cave in Washington State and one of the deepest caves in the nation. There's actually an 800 foot uh, drop off at one point, which is, is difficult to even imagine how deep that is. But the location of it is kept secret by the spelunking community in Washington. And if you do find it, they've actually locked the entrance to it because you need a lot of specialty equipment. One of the things that they actually talk about are ascenders. These are ascenders. Uh, they're essentially handles that you strap to your harness 
and then clip onto a rope and allow you to pull yourself up if you're in a location where you need to climb out. So a lot of people will uh, spike in or rope up their equipment. They'll throw the rope down to the bottom of the cave and then rappel down, and then they'll have to use ascenders to get back out of it. And that is, as you might guess, a little technical and difficult. So if you're gonna go exploring a cave, you really need to know what you're doing. Uh, and this is a great question. Yes, the water level does rain or raise during the rainy season in that subterranean lake down there. Uh, not by too much. At no point is it entirely filling up the cave, but it is enough to, to be dramatic. One of the cool things about that one too is that a lot of um, speleologists or people who study caves have done some scuba diving in that cave and discovered uh, subterranean subaquatic shrimp that exist nowhere else in the world that live just down in that little cave down there. And they're doing a lot more exploration on it, but uh, it's, it's slow going sometimes. So here's another one of the ape caves. And if you're looking to get some more information about caves, uh, I'm going to put up a link to the, the cave sort of handbook on Washington state that has a ton of cool information about all of the caves that have been documented in the state. I'm also sharing right now a link to some of the National Park Service resources on learning about caves. So if you're interested in doing some more like at home distance learning about caves, you've got a, an opportunity to look into those materials right there in our comments below. And uh, I will share the, the cave handbook link right after we're done here. But if you guys have any more questions about caves in Washington, please let me know. Uh, I'm always excited to talk about caves. It's a, it's a deep subject for me. <laughs> oh. See, I waited for the puns until the end. But it, it's just something that's so cool and we have so many great caves in Washington state. And if you're interested in exploring them, I always encourage people to do your research, make sure that you take at least three light sources and backups, always let people know where you're going and uh, travel with an adult because caves are dangerous. But for now, I'm gonna leave you guys with that. My name is Captain Chris Stottinger. I'm a global adventurer and travel expert and guide here in Tacoma with Pretty Gritty Tours. And I hope to see you guys soon when we talk about some of the other cool things in the area. Until then, always let me know if you have any questions. I'll do my best to answer them. Keep on exploring. I'll see you guys soon.